What's up, everybody? It is Colton Denning, the host of the Two Stripes Podcast. Before we get into the show this week, I want to remind everybody that if you like the Two Stripes Podcast or want to listen to any old episodes, be sure to head to iTunes and search Two Stripes Podcast and subscribe, leave a review, and leave a star rating for me and any positive or negative feedback, anything to help the show. And then you can also go to SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod. With that in mind, let's get into this week's show. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast for you, the college football fan. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host, coming to you on Monday, May 15th, 2017, from Boulder, Colorado. I think I got a fun show for you guys today. It's a little bit shorter than some of the other ones have been, but I think just as informative and one that you will enjoy just as much. Last Thursday, I got the opportunity to talk to the managing editor of BringOnTheCats.com, John Morse, about everything Kansas State football. Now, for a lot of people, Kansas State football is probably something that's a little bit off the radar, maybe even a little bit boring. Kansas State has always had that reputation under head coach Bill Snyder of being the cliche, quote-unquote, blue-collar program. But there's a lot of fun stuff going on with K-State. They've been one of the most consistent Power 5 conference teams in the country over the last five or six seasons. And now that Bill Snyder's career is kind of coming to an end, or at least getting near the end, there's a bit of a battle inside the athletic department over who is going to fill that void, whether it's going to be a son, Sean, or going to be somebody from outside the program. So I talked with John about that at length and how much of a story this has been for Kansas State fans over the past few seasons and some of the other candidates for that job once Bill Snyder decides to step down, whenever that may be. Other than that, though, we talked about the 2017 season, why Kansas State is poised for another nine, maybe even ten win season, and whether or not the Wildcats can win the Big 12. So let's get right into it. Here is John Morris of BringOnTheCats.com. To join me to talk all things Kansas State football is the managing editor of BringOnTheCats.com, John Morse. John, what's happening, man? Not a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining the show. So Kansas State seems like it's a program that always flies under the radar. I know it's it's cliche, but under Bill Snyder does everything blue collar. It's a program that's consistent. They've won nine games now in four of the last six seasons. But as the offseason's gone on, there's been some unfortunate news recently with, with Bill Snyder in the last year and him battling throat cancer. Good news, he beat it, but 77 years old, and this week there was a pretty fascinating story from Dennis Dodd of CBSSports.com about the perceived battle going on within the Kansas State Athletic Department over who's going to take that mantle next from him. And and before we get into the specifics of that, how much of a story has this been amongst K-State fans, and are people prepared for this? Is this something that you think could get pretty ugly or or what's the general feeling about this from Kansas state fans from our perspective, you know, this is something that we've been churning over for really four or five years now. And a lot of what Dennis Dodd said in that article is stuff that we already knew. One of the biggest points of contention between Bill Snyder and John Curry over the last few years has been the succession plan because, you know, obviously Curry wanted to move on, to a bigger, better job from his perspective. And the one big thing he really felt he needed to have a chance to do to make that happen is make a big hire to replace Bill Snyder, especially after a lot of people would consider blowing it with Bruce Weber. And Bill has made no secret now for several years that he wants his son to succeed him. But there are a lot of people who have problems with that, both from a, an ethical perspective and a, in a technical perspective. And when I say an ethical perspective, I don't mean that, you know, it's a horrible thing for Bill to want Sean to succeed him, but it, it's bad optics when 
you're talking about somebody who has never even been an offensive coordinator or a defensive coordinator at any program. Sean has spent his entire professional career in Manhattan as an assistant coach for special teams or director of football operations. Now, as director of football operations, obviously, he picked up a great deal of of experience doing things that are involved with running the program. But the head coach of the football program also ultimately has to, you know, coach. So there are a lot of people who, in their hearts, would on being the head coach. It's not that anybody has a problem with Sean Snyder or doesn't want Bill Snyder to have his legacy. But there's concerns that he won't be able to do the job. Now there's a new athletic director in Gene Taylor. He was at North Dakota State for a period of time, took a job at Iowa, and now is in Manhattan. He had a couple of choice quotes in the article and and kind of towed the line of saying, you know, I want Bill to have his say, but as an AD, he also wants to have his say as well. Do you think that K-State hired him with the mind that, and, and Bill Snyder was quoted in the article as, as saying that he made a call to him before he was hired. Do you think he was hired with this in mind that maybe he'd be a little more lenient in that regard of, of bringing Sean Snyder on after whenever Bill Snyder decides to leave? Knowing what we know of the people involved and their personalities and, and how they behave, I strongly suspect that what Bill wanted was an assurance that Sean would at least be seriously considered. But that ultimately he understands that it's Gene Taylor's decision. So when you look at the short list of if it's not Sean Snyder, there's guys like Craig Bull has been mentioned, new Oregon defensive coordinator Jim Levitt, a couple other guys from that coaching tree that have ties to Bill Snyder. You personally, who do you think is on that list outside of Sean Snyder? It's not a long list. I'll tell you that Bull would definitely be on it. Levitt is obviously on it. I mean, there is a reason why he's got that clause in his contract at Oregon, whether it's just because he wanted it there just in case as as a, hey, K-State, I'm here if you need me, or whether something's been said to make him need to have that clause, we don't know. But And the, the other name that you didn't mention that everybody wants to talk about is Brent Venables. Yeah. The defensive coordinator at Clemson who, of course, played for Snyder, coached for Snyder, went with Bob Stoops to Oklahoma. There are some people who don't like Brent because he went to Oklahoma with Bob Stoops and some other things that we don't want to get into because they're rumor. But he is probably the best candidate in terms of what he's accomplished and taking into account. And Jim Levitt's done a really good job rehabilitating himself, but obviously there's some baggage there from his time at South Florida. But... There are a lot of K-State fans who still haven't forgiven Brent Venables. So there's baggage there. With Craig Bull, there's a perception that he picked up the luggage from a steamrolling North Dakota State program that was already primed to move up to FCS and simply kept the momentum going into what they became and then went to Wyoming and started to struggle. Although, to be fair... What happened in Wyoming last season makes you think, hey, maybe he is a guy. Yeah, especially with how he's been able to develop his quarterback there who may end up being the top or one of the top quarterbacks taken in next year's NFL draft. And for me as an outsider, this is so fascinating because on one hand you have a guy in Sean Snyder who is not only the coach's son, but he's been at Kansas State for cumulative years longer now than his dad has given the, uh, the retirement, the three-year retirement that Snyder had between 2006 and 2008. And then on the other hand, like you're saying, you have three guys who are very qualified candidates in Brent Venables, Craig Bull, and Jim Levitt, but who also have some of the baggage for different reasons that you mentioned. So definitely going to be something to, to, uh, to really keep an eye on and interesting to get your perspective. Another interesting thing about this that I did want to bring up is You know, there's a perception out there in the wider college football community that K-State's dead when Snyder's gone. Now, stop and think about this. There are four guys lining up for this job that a lot of other schools would happily hire. It's when, when Snyder, if Snyder can't make it through 2017 or has to retire after the season or even has to retire before the season starts, 
you know, if that happens, you're probably going to end up with an interim coach managing the team this year. But after that, K-State's not going to have to bow and scrape and, and dig under rocks looking for a guy willing to take over the program. There are good candidates that want to come to Manhattan, and I think that's the most fascinating thing about how this story is suddenly playing out. Because for years, all we've heard is, well, what are you going to do when he's gone? I'm glad you brought that up because not only, as we mentioned earlier, they've won nine games four times in the past six seasons. As you're saying, they also have guys, very qualified coaches that will line up for that job to come in. But all the outside stuff aside, Bill Snyder's health, his age, a possible coaching transition. You mentioned the possibility that he could retire in August or September. Just looking at the program as a whole, how, how do you feel about it? Because it seems from like from the outside looking in that they're in a pretty good place right now. Yeah, it's been very interesting. You, you, here we get into another thing where the public perception of things doesn't necessarily match up with the reality because of the way K-State does things. We all know that K-State does not score big in the recruiting rankings. You know, K-State is not out signing five-star guys. But Bill Snyder goes after guys he wants. And in the last three or four years, thanks to some younger coaches, including former K-State wide receiver Andre Coleman and uh, defensive coach Blake Seiler, who are just fantastic recruiters, K-State's last two or three recruiting classes, although they haven't scored highly in the recruiting rankings, have actually been pretty good. And you see that by who's actually been taking the field for K-State the last three years. How often has Bill Snyder ever started a freshman from the jump? Almost never, but there have been two or three in the last three or four years now. And, you know, that's another thing that's going to play into the coaching search, if we're really honest. Nobody really knows how Sean Snyder is as a recruiter. Brent Venables is obviously a great recruiter. Craig Bull's a pretty good recruiter. Jim Levitt's a good recruiter. But what's happened is that they've brought in a lot of really talented guys, and they're stacked at certain positions that they haven't been in the past. K-State's got running so many running backs that they don't even know what they're going to do with the third-string guy. And a quarterback guy. who can run. And a quarterback who can run. Wide receiver Corey Sutton announced a couple of weeks ago that he's going to transfer, and he's a fantastic receiver. The reason he's leaving is he's buried at like fifth or sixth in the depth chart. So the biggest problem K-State's going to have this season is rebuilding the linebacking core, which got surprised by the early departure of Elijah Lee. And obviously in the Big 12, playing defense is a challenge for anybody. Yeah. But other than that, they're really set up for a run this year. And not only that, they don't lose anybody this year, except for Will Geary on the defensive line and Jesse Ertz at quarterback. But Ertz theoretically has another year because he hasn't claimed the medical waiver from when he went out on the first play of the season in 2015. So we might as well just get right into the offense then. You mentioned Jesse Ertz and some of the skill position talent they have coming back at wide receiver and the loaded running back group and last year it seemed like they started really slow and the last six games of 2016 the offense put it together what do you think the key to that continuity is heading into 2017 well first off uh and this is no secret to anybody who even pays half an ounce of attention to the program k-state's always an excellent team with a second year starter at quarterback Snyder's system is hard to pick up, but once you've got it, you can excel. Now, Jesse Ertz, the reason things picked up for K-State early in the midseason last year is because Ertz had already had two years in the program and one season where he had been basically training to, to start before he went down with an injury. So his pickup time at actually physically running the offense was shortened. And now here he is. He's got a year of actual experience, two years of functional experience, and three years of, of book experience. So we're not expecting any problems behind center. Ertz is known more as a runner and a pretty damn good one at that. And to start last season, in the first nine games of the season, he only had two games where he had over seven yards per attempt. And that was against Florida Atlantic and Southwest Missouri State. But in Kansas State's final four games, he exceeded that threshold to end the season. 
now in his second year, as, as you alluded to, that improvement that we've seen in Kansas State quarterbacks, what do you expect from him in terms of passing development and the offense overall in the passing game from a group that finished 99th in passing S&P Plus last season? How big of a jump do you think that they're going to take? I think you're going to see a sizable jump for one very big reason. A lot of the improvement in the passing game, or another way of looking at a lot of the problems with the passing game early in the season, was simply a lack of um, chemistry between Ertz and a bunch of guys that didn't have a lot of experience playing Division I wide receiver. What we saw on film as the season went on was the receivers got better at running their routes. The receivers got better at holding on to the ball when it hit them. So Ertz was not necessarily the problem early in the season. And now those receivers, with the exception of Deontay Burton, who wasn't a fantastic wide receiver, but he was steady and, and competent and a rock for the unit, the other guys all have another year too. So it's all steamrolling. Ertz went over 1,000 yards rushing last season and was pretty explosive in doing so. Uh, last question on him, where the hell does Kansas State find these quarterbacks? You know, it's not like Jesse Ertz was some guy that they pulled out of a closet somewhere. He was the All-State quarterback in Iowa his senior season in high school. So, you know, obviously he was a good player that people were noticing. But again, you know, he, he wasn't that he wasn't that big. And then by big, I mean workout big. And that's the thing K-State actually is really good at doing in the recruiting level is they'll find guys who may be a little bit undersized and get them in the weight room. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got a bowling ball like Will Geary on the defensive line who just, he's a boulder. But it's it's just one of those things, the, the methodology of K-State when it comes to recruiting is, is they go out and they look for guys who perform in environments that other schools may view as oh well it doesn't mean much he's playing at a 2a school or whatever and those are the guys that come to k-state excel get named all big 12 and get drafted earlier on you referenced kansas state losing their top three linebackers from 2016 who are some of the players to watch for as they look to fill that void and the ton of production lost from that group but i'm assuming in just watching K-State over the years, especially with some of the players they've been able to develop at linebacker, that they have those guys, but who are they? The main key to that unit this season is going to be Trent Tanking. He's he's the captain of the unit for years now. He's been a special teams beast, and he finally started getting some, some time in the linebacker rotation last year, and he's the one that has stood out the most. The rest of it is still really up in the air. The guys are playing well, but Nobody's really reaching out to grab the horns, so to speak. There's Elijah Sullivan, who uh, had been an Auburn commit and flipped to K-State on signing day a couple of years ago. He's in the mix, but in a lot of ways, it's hard to tell. We didn't get a lot of information out of the spring game because a lot of guys were held out. And Bill Snyder also kind of keeps a very tight rein on spring practice. So we don't really know who's going to be in there. Kansas State always seems to have a bevy of talented Juco kids that come in. And whether they sit for a season or play right away, they always seem to produce, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And we've seen that with some of the linebackers they've brought in over the years. Is that the case for 2017? And if so, who are some of the names to watch for uh, out of those former Juco kids? On the defensive side, I think we got Daquan Patton, who didn't play in the spring game, but he's pretty highly thought of and should be part of the system. In fact, a lot of the Juco guys didn't play in the spring game either. So it's like I said, it's, it's really hard to talk about what's going to happen until we get into fall <laughs> practice because we just don't know. It's It's been kind of under wraps. So shifting into expectations for 2017, based off of what we do know in the players that are coming back, how likely do you think it is that Kansas State has another nine-win season? And does Kansas State have a legit shot at the Big 12 title this year? To the first question, I think it's almost a certainty that, you know, at worst they'll end up nine and four. They may have, you know, eight and four with a bowl win or nine and three with a bowl loss or whatever. But, yeah, I think there's a legit shot that if they can get past Oklahoma, which, you know, has been a bit of a problem in Manhattan this decade, but that's one of the strangest situations that's been going on <laughs> the last few years is 
until last year, neither team had won at home <clears throat> since 2010. If they can get past Oklahoma in Manhattan, that leaves Oklahoma State at Stillwater as probably the most daunting task facing them. I think there's a shot. I'm not homer enough to go bet on it. <laughs> if the linebackers come together and perform at a even just an acceptable level, the raw improvement on the defensive line and the defensive secondary should be enough to keep the K-State back at the top of the Big 12 defensively. And again, that second year starting quarterback situation in K-State, especially when K-State really lost nothing on offense other than Deontay Burton, is going to surprise some people. Well, Kansas State always seems to be in the mix, whether they are at the start of the year or like last year where they finished the year strong, and it'll certainly be fun to watch them again. I know I always like watching them come up and nip everybody in the ass and make a run at the Big 12 title game. And if you want to keep up to date on all things Kansas State football, you can do so by going to bringonthecats.com and finding all of John's work there. He is the managing editor. If you want to follow them on Twitter, you can do so by going to Twitter and searching at bringonthecats. And then you can find John on Twitter as well at John F. Morse. That's J-O-N-F-M-O-R-S-E. John, want to thank you for joining the show and dropping knowledge on Kansas State. You're welcome. I appreciate your time. Big thanks to John Morse for joining the show. And, of course, make sure to check out BringOnTheCats.com. When football season rolls around, it will certainly be a fun season for Kansas State and to see if they can hop up into the mix again as a contender in the Big 12 and possibly even sneak by and win the Big 12 this season. That game against Oklahoma at home should be a lot of fun. And following the Bill Snyder storyline as well should be very interesting. I I thought it was surprising that both Dennis Dodd in that article we referenced and John talked about the possibility of Bill Snyder stepping down in either August or at the beginning of the season. And if that happens, Kansas State will be in a very weird position, and you would assume that Sean Snyder would take over the role as interim head coach, and that would act as his audition for that job. So the news around Kansas State football this offseason may increase yet. We'll have to see once we get into August and September. That's it for this week's show, though. I am headed off to Austin, Texas to go visit my brother and spend the week down in Longhorn Country. Hope to drop another pod later this week, maybe even stay in the Big 12. But if not, want to thank you guys for listening to this week's episode of the Two Stripes Podcast. And you can go to iTunes, search Two Stripes Podcast, find all the old episodes there, like, review, subscribe, leave feedback, all of that good stuff there, and then go to soundcloud.com slash two stripes pod. Can also find all of my work there and follow me on Twitter if you're so inclined at Dubsco. Hope everybody has a good start to their week. Hopefully, I'll talk to you guys later on this week. But until then, my name is Colton Denning, and this has been the Two Stripes Podcast. <laughs>